All right. Hello, everyone. This is Antonia Angres. She was born in Los Angeles and raised in San Jose, Costa Rica. She's a graduate of Brown University and the University of Minnesota MFA program, where she was a Winifred Fiction Fellow and a College of Liberal Arts Fellow. She lives in Minneapolis with her husband, the artist Connor McManus. Sirens and Muses is her first novel. Antonia, thank you for being here and take it away. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in. Um, I'm going to read from the very beginning. So kind of wild to just open up my own book. Um, all right. <laughs> Luisa's first assignment at Rin College of Art was paint home. She'd left home 12 days ago, and now as she looked out the classroom window, it startled her still to see hills and sullen, huddled townhouses, the New England sky close and cold, nothing like at home where the sky overwhelmed the land, a drum of clouds and rain and strange shafts of tawny light. She'd never been her, on her own before. Her year at South Louisiana Community College didn't count. She had slept in her old bedroom, borrowed her mother's car to get to class, worked the same shifts at Chez Jacqueline, eaten Sunday dinner at Grandma and Pepe's. Louisa was homesick. It was normal, she told herself. Even at 19, almost 20, it was normal. And so alone in her studio, she'd cried a little as she painted Lake Martin at dusk, bald cypresses echoed by their dark reflections in the water. It was a placid scene, but ominous, tinged with danger, curdled at the edges like a faded bruise. In the background, low swollen clouds gleamed with uncanny clarity and a flutter of pintails took off over the marsh. In the foreground, an ibis waited in the shallows, its bow-shaped beak slicing through the water. Its plumage was a soft, unglossed white, except for its black wingtips. Its pearly blue eye met the viewers. She'd chosen an ibis because grandma had once told her that it, was, that it symbolized resilience. It was the last animal to take shelter before a hurricane and the first to reappear after the storm. No, not resilience, mom had said, overhearing. Regeneration and wisdom. Danger, Louisa thought. Optimism. Dinner, Pepper added. Hunting ibises was illegal, but he'd grown up shooting them for the table and occasionally still brought one home. The meat was orange and fishy. Now, a thousand miles away from him, Louisa stood alone in an empty classroom. She'd arrived early to secure a spot on the southern wall, and she was pleased with how her painting looked there, bathed in that diffuse northern light, what mom called painterly light. One window was cracked to let in a breeze, but the room still smelled sharply of oils and turpentine. Afternoon sun gilded the floorboards. As Louisa's classmates arrived and hung their work, she turned to the wall and ran her fingers over the thumbtack holes. The other sophomores all knew each other already, had spent foundation year together, and in their presence, Louisa felt furiously shy. Maureen walked in, in a manila folder under her arm. All professors went by their first names at Rin, which did nothing to make Maureen less formidable, though her wardrobe consisted entirely of overlarge t-shirts and paint-stained cargo pants, the pockets full of jangly objects. She carried herself with a pugnacious confidence Louisa occasionally saw in certain older women who would stop caring what the world thought about them. Everyone ready? Said Maureen. She opened the folder. We'll go alphabetically this time. Louisa Arsenault, you're up. She pronounced it Arsenex. Arsenault, Louisa corrected her softly. It's French. She shifted so she was standing next to her painting with her back to the wall. She hugged her sketchbook to her chest as her classmates, all 15 of them, gathered in a semicircle. Only Maureen brought a chair, its legs squeaking against the floor. She set it in front of Louisa's painting and sat down, crossing her arms. There was a long silence, her classmates' faces unreadable. Maureen wore bifocals and she had a habit of tipping up her chin when appraising a painting as though she were looking down at it. Finally, Jack Kalikia, who wore a baseball cap embroidered with Eat the Rich said, 
my problem with your painting isn't that it's kitschy exactly. He stood near the back, but he towered over everyone, his voice carrying clear across the room. He was known for his digital mashups of assassinated presidents and murdered rappers. The notorious JFK, Tupac Lincoln, Freaky McKinley. My problem is that it screams, I'm from the South, but it's like Southern Gothic light. Louisa bristled. She wasn't just from the South. She was from Acadiana. Expelled by the British from Nova Scotia, her Acadian ancestors had settled in the swamps of southwestern Louisiana before it was even part of the United States. Pepper, who as a child had been beaten for speaking Cajun French at school, had served as an interpreter for American troops in France during World War II. She wasn't Southern, she was Cajun. Louisa flipped to a blank page in her sketchbook. She hunched over and wrote Southern Gothic Light, slowly in neat cursive. What do we think about the formal elements, said Maureen. Emma Ochoa, who made brooding canvases about being in a long distance relationship, said something about the blue and the clouds picking up the color of the bird's eye and giving the painting nice movement. Demir Erdem, who was Turkish and movie star handsome, smiled at Lisa and praised her use of red in the cypress bark. Movement, Louisa wrote, cypress bark, red. While making the painting, building the frame, stretching and gessoing and sanding the canvas, sketching out the composition, consulting her photos of Lake Martin, refining her lines with each iteration, Louisa had fallen in love with it. She'd seen what this painting might do, how it might make someone feel. She'd hoped to convey how intensely she experienced the landscape of her home, how heavily the air weighs, hinting at deluge and decay, how plants grow with such, such vigor that a cat's claw vine can crack a house's foundation. The brushwork is really accomplished, said Alejandro Diaz, who always wore the same pair of lace-up boots, which Luisa took to mean he was probably also on scholarship. Say more about that, said Maureen. Like the texture of the paint on the surface of the canvas, the impasto, it's almost liquid, like stormy water, sort of a form follows content kind of thing. Impasto, Luisa wrote, frenzied. Good technique, said Karina Piantek, Luisa's roommate. Karina stood apart from the group, slouched against the wall, she had her long hair gathered up in both hands. She'd been braiding it as she listened to the crit. Now she dropped the braid, letting it unravel. But I feel like I've seen this painting before. Luisa wasn't sure how she'd ended up with Karina as a roommate. The other sophomores all had singles, or else they roomed with friends. And Karina was wealthy. Her parents were art collectors. And the other day, Luisa had sat behind her in lecture and seen her order a pair of $200 sunglasses. Surely she could have had her pick of housing. Luisa had decorated her side of the room with family photos and a Festival International 2009 poster from two years ago. Karina had hung only an oval mirror and a small canvas that evoked the squalid sea and seemed in its perfection less painted than conjured. Karina hadn't been mean to Louisa, but she hadn't been nice either. Each morning, she woke at seven and drew in bed for an hour, sketchbook propped against her knees. Her duvet was creamy white with thin threads of light blue, but she didn't seem to care about dirtying it. Louisa had admired this ritual and resolved to imitate it, but the other day when she'd pulled out her own sketchbook, Karina had looked over and lifted a single pale eyebrow. Wordlessly, Louisa got dressed and went to the common room, where instead of drawing, she spent an hour playing angry birds on her phone and brooding over whether her roommate liked her, which was stupid because she wanted to be a great artist and great artists didn't care about people liking them. They were too busy at disappearing into their work. Since that morning, Louisa had continued to wake at the same time as Karina, but instead of drawing in bed, she fixed a mug of instant coffee in Hope Hall's kitchenette before walking to Williams Park, the bluff that overlooked the town of Stonewater, where she drew the skyline until her first class at nine. She skipped breakfast to save dining room credits, her scholarship covered only the smallest meal plan, and put lots of milk and sugar in her coffee to compensate. 
Maureen gave Karina a sharp look. You've seen it before, explain. The truth was Louisa would have liked to draw Karina. She wore elegant billowy clothing, wide-legged trousers and floor grazing skirts, patterned shawls and complicated wraps. Her face had an austere, graven quality, like an old statue, and she had the most magnificent hair Louisa had ever seen, thick and silky, a sort of icy blonde. Once Louisa dreamed she'd cut it all off with she'd cut it all off with her exacto knife while Karina slept. Another night she dreamed about kissing her. It's the way I imagine an LA or New York artist might depict the South, said Karina. It's just a landscape. It's just a bird. What's it trying to do? What's it trying to say? You weren't supposed to talk while being critted. Just a bird, Louisa wrote. She thought of how Karina knew what she looked like first thing in the morning or when she came home from her shift at the cafeteria, fingers pruned, smelling of dish soap. Crit was a different more brutal kind of intimacy. If the painting's meaning could be expressed in words, why would she paint it, said Ivy Morton. A foxtail always hung from her back pocket. Real or fake, Louisa couldn't tell. It's an accomplished painting, said Karina. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just reminding Louisa that art has to do something. In her sketchbook, Louisa wrote, do something and drew a quick little doodle of an egret. Every artist had something they drew for reassurance. For her, it was birds. Mom was always doodling intricate little insects all over her grade books. She wondered what Maureen drew for comfort, what Karina drew. What about self-expression, said Ivy. What about it, said Karina. What if the painting reflects an experience of Louisa's that you're not aware of? Just because something is meaningful personally doesn't make it meaningful as art. It's like just because something actually happened doesn't make it a good story. Louisa wrote, meaningful? Under the egret. Enough, said Maureen. You're very too theoretical. I'd like you to go back to discussing Louisa's painting now. Face burning, Louisa looked at her canvas for the first time since the crit had begun. She saw it now as Karina did. How was it possible to love something so much when you were alone with it, only to hate it as soon as other people saw it? Alejandro spoke. I don't think the painting's about a bird. To me, it makes me really aware of time. I think it's about the moment before something terrible happens the loneliness of being alone in that moment. Alejandro had delicate, almost pretty features and wore a gold chain that disappeared inside his shirt. Luisa wondered what hung on it, something glib, the strangest dog tags, or something sincere like a crucifix. Yes, said Maureen, maybe it's the contrast between the large smooth areas in the sky and the active textured water. It has this contradictory quality of both stillness and movement that Louisa executes well. She opened up the manila folder again. All right, Jack Calicchia, you're up. They shuffled to the opposite side of the classroom where Jack had hung a piece titled Still Life with Family, a dark blurry painting in shades of ochre and burnt umber where the only discernible objects were a pair of ashtrays a broken mirror, and several pink pills. A few conflicting interpretations were proposed. Jack seemed pleased. Luisa hovered near the back of the semicircle and kept quiet. Then they moved on to Alejandro's painting, a hazy rendering of a deserted city bus stop at sunset, telephone wires crisscrossing a sky of pink and gold and ocean glow blue. I have this theory, said Maureen, that every male artist goes through a telephone wire phase. Luisa glanced at Alejandro in sympathy, but he be betrayed no reaction. Karina went last. Her painting was a large abstract piece that seemed to mute the paintings hanging alongside it. She was unafraid of bold colors, cursive loops of pink, pools of blue, slivers of black. To these glowing fields of color, she'd added bits of cloth, frills of lace, even embroidery. The result was a painting so lively it seemed to leap off the wall. 
It teased the eye, it took up space, it was unapologetic. It seemed to say, all those aesthetic dogmas you old men spent your lives squabbling over, here they all are in bed together. Jack Kulikia said something vaguely critical about the painting being self-consciously feminine, but it was largely admired. Karina absorbed the praise without expression, long arms folded over her chest. She didn't take notes. After class lit out, Karina paused at the top of the painting building steps to light a cigarette. As Louisa walked by, Karina called. Hey, heading back to our room? Louisa turned. Yeah? I'll walk with you, Karina said, coming down the steps. Okay, Louisa said wearily. They set off across the green. Students lounged in the grass with their sketchbooks and water bottles emblazoned with Rin's crest, an ornate W above the words pro arte utile, Latin for, for useful abilities. This motto was the subject of many jokes, but Luisa, who'd read up on the school's history, thought it made sense. It had been founded in the 1800s by early feminists who wanted women to apply the principles of art to trade and manufacture, to become economically self-sufficient. Now Rin was co-ed, and its students seemed less interested in trade and manufacture than in curating their aesthetic identities. Your identity, inseparable from your work, was what you'd sell when you went out into the world. Do you have siblings? Louisa asked Karina. She wasn't sure she wanted to be friends with her roommate, but she'd been taught it was polite to ask people questions about themselves. No, it's just me. I'm an only child, too. I used to beg my mom for a sister. They passed under one of the stone archways. It was a lovely school. Ivy, brick, a clock tower, paper pale houses converted into classrooms. A spare Puritan beauty. Quaint as fuck, people said. Though one often blighted by rogue installation artists erecting sculptures on the quads in the middle of the night. They were made of things like Legos and packing pellets and old furniture, but the administration let them stay until they fell apart. Louisa had applied because famous artists had studied here, people whose work hung in museums, whose names appeared in her art history readings. Sometimes she had to pinch herself. I am here. Did you have Maureen last year, Louisa said, for painting? No, first semester we had Ellen Hong, and then we had Clark Strickland. How were they? Ellen was fine. Clark was a kind of a dick. How so? Oh, he was just sexist. He'd encourage the girls to paint from life and the boys to do abstraction. Yikes, said Louisa. So what was wrong with painting from life? Old school macho bullshit, said Karina, exhaling a cloud of smoke. That was Clark's thing. They fell silent as they crossed Valence Street. Casting about for something to say, Louisa asked Karina what she'd done over the summer. Um, I traveled a bit. Where'd you go? Karina tossed her cigarette onto the street, then stopped in the middle of the sidewalk to light another. A few different places. Her gaze snagged on something over Louisa's shoulder. Louisa turned to see what it was. They were standing in front of the Rin Museum, where a banner advertising a new exhibit, where a banner advertised a new exhibit by someone named Robert Berger. I know him, Karina said abruptly. Robert Berger? Karina nodded. Like, know him, know him? Yeah. I've never heard of him. How did you meet? Through my mother, said Karina, in a tone that invited no further questions. The rest of the walk passed in silence. When they got back to Hope Hall, Karina went to take a shower. Louisa was debating what to do. It was early for dinner, but if she went to the cafeteria now, there'd be fewer people to see her eating by herself. When she noticed Karina's sketchbook peeking out from her bag, she hesitated, then furtively crossed the room and slipped it out, flipped through it quickly. God, Karina was talented. There were studies for future abstract paintings, sketches from their figure drawing class, some lustrous pastel work, and Louisa made a little noise of sh shock in the back of her throat, a drawing of Louisa's own face. In the drawing, her eyes were downcast, half closed, her lips slightly parted in an expression of bliss or stupefaction. She wasn't sure she'd ever made such a face in her life. It was a beautiful drawing, intimate and violating. 
Down the hall, she heard the shower stop. She closed the sketchbook, stuck it back in Karina's bag, and went off to a dinner she was no longer hungry for. And that is the end of the first chapter and where I will stop. Antonia, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Even in just the first chapter, there's so much wonderful work going on. I feel like every student has such a big ego uh, and they all have big egos in very different ways. So there's so much clash happening um, just in these first few paragraphs. Um, and I feel like the work is so well steeped into just what it's like to be an artist and go to an art school. And then there's these juxtapositions of the character being poor and surrounded by all this wealth. It's it's absolutely lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'll kick off the Q&A and ask a couple of questions. Uh, so I'll give everybody else in the audience time to think of questions they want to ask. Um, if you want to ask over like video and audio, you're welcome to do so. If you'd rather not be recorded, you can also send your questions over the chat and I'll read them for you. Um, but to start, I would like to hear you talk a little bit about how you sort of surrounded yourself in the art world. Because from what I understand, you yourself are not a visual artist, but you represent the world so well. I'm curious what the work was that you did to sort of put yourself in that world and, and bring it to life. Well, I, I, my mom's an artist, so I grew, I definitely grew up in a household where there was art making going on and there was, I was surrounded by a lot of art um, and by a lot of books about art and just, you know, my mom would sit in the living room and, and make her work. Um, so, so I, I definitely feel like I grew up in a household where art was really valued and, and, you know, often spoken of and where art making was really valued. Um, I went to college um, right next door to the Rhode Island School of Design. So I was I wasn't at RISD, but I I was, you know, right across the street. Um, and I um, when I was an undergraduate, I um, met uh, my husband, um, who is a painter. Uh, and he he uh, he was also not a um, a RISD student, but he took a lot of classes there. I went to Brown, which had a um, program with RISD that would kind of allow anyone to, any student at RISD to take classes at Brown and vice versa. So there was a, sort of a lot of cross-curricular stuff happening. So while I was an undergraduate, um, I, you know, I was, I had just met this, this painter who um, I was getting to know and watching him work. Um, I was also peering in a lot of his, his paintings as like kind of his model. Um, and around that time, I began uh, figure, I began modeling for figure drawing classes for extra money. Um, I was like 19 and I thought it was super, like a super like romantic thing to do, but it also paid really well. It paid like twice as much as any of the other jobs on campus. And so while I had this job, I became really fascinated with the art students um, because it seemed to me that they were sort of having this college experience that was much more intense than the one that I was having. They were, you know, in this kind of this, this pressure cooker environment. Um, and they were sort of figuring out who they were going to be at, not only as people, the way that I think everyone is, you know, flailing around trying to figure themselves out at that age. I certainly was. Um, but they were also kind of figuring out what their, like, I guess their brand was as an artist. Like, what is my aesthetic identity? What kind of artist am I going to be? And so, as a writer, um, and I've, I've, you know, I've been writing fiction for a long time since I was in my teens. As a writer, that really interested me as kind of an environment in which to set a story or a novel. Um, so, I didn't begin writing this book until after I'd graduated from college. I was in my early twenties, um, living in New Orleans and teaching at an elementary school at the time. Um, but I, I was sort of casting about for um, something to write about. I had gone through this like kind of uh, this agonizing creative drive period where I hadn't I hadn't really written in a year. Um, and I I took a class at at a place a lot like writers.com um, at uh, the the New Orleans Writers Workshops, and I I came up with this short story about um, a a young woman who has just dropped out of art school. Um, and I showed the story to my uh, to my partner and he read it and said, you know, I think this could be a novel. There's a lot of meat here. You could do more with this. Uh, so I 
I started writing it. Um, and it took me a really long time. It took me like, you know, close to seven years from start to finish. Um, but I was, you know, writing it with, a, you know, while li also living with an artist. Um, so that was really helpful to like have someone in my living room, literally making art, just, you know, just kind of the way that I'd grown up. Um, so I would say that it was you know, a lot of different sort of influences and experiences that kind of cross pollinated to to create this, um, you know, this story set at an art school very much like the one that I went to college next door to. It's very reassuring to hear that you can go through a year long dry spell and still write a book that's reviewed in the New York Times. So, oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, <laughs> definitely happy to hear that. <laughs> Um, you said that it took you seven years to write this book, um, and that's not necessarily like out of the ordinary for writing a novel, um, but I'm just curious to know, you know, how many drafts did you go through, how did the story, you know, the story that you started with, how did it evolve into what it is now? Seven years is impossible to summarize, but I'm curious if you can talk at least a little bit about everything that went into that process. Oh my God, it went through so many drafts, <laughs> like 10 drafts, maybe. I Probably 10, maybe more. Um, I, I, at a certain point, I just kind of lost count. Um, yeah, it it took me a really long time to finish a first draft. Um, that, that was kind of the hardest part. It took me several years to actually finish a first draft. But once I had finished the first draft and once I had kind of a bird's eye view of the shape of, of the book, um, it became a little bit easier to start moving through drafts more quickly. I will say that the, you know, it's it changed a lot from first draft to final draft. The first draft didn't have four points of view. Um, the, you know, a lot of the storylines changed. I made a decision to uh, um, kind of switch settings midway through the novel. Uh, originally, I'd planned to have the whole thing take place on campus and be a campus novel. Um, so it, you know, it was, it, it took a really, really long time and a lot of different versions. And I sort of feel like I had also had kind of to grow as a person and as a writer in order to write the book the way it needed to be. Uh, the first draft certainly wasn't any good. Um, and I, I don't think that, you know, I don't think that I could have written as good a novel when I was, you know, 25 as when I was, you know, third, I finished it by the time uh, a little bit after I turned 30. And I think I, I needed that time um, to really grow as a writer. I would, I mean, I would have been embarrassed to publish, you know, the version of it that I had in my, in my mid twenties. Uh, and I know there are a lot of writers, myself included, who agonize a lot over publishing young. And I, I, I think that it's, I'm really glad I took my time is I guess what I'm saying. Definitely. I'll ask one more question and then I'll open it up to everyone else. Um, you set the book in 2012 and I had to laugh at the your character um, playing Angry Birds. <laughs> I, was, I was so thrown back to, to 2012 and of course I think I was in, still in middle school then but it was so funny to hear that. Um, I feel like I don't even know if I could write a novel set in like 2018. Like what happened four years ago? I'm curious to know, like, especially as you were writing it and you know, you got further away from this time period because you also talked about Occupy Wall Street and mm -hmm. everything that was happening in the early 2010s. Was it hard for you to sort of situate yourself back in that time period? And what did you sort of do? So when I started writing it, it was like 2014. So it really wasn't too far removed. What when I first began. Um, and then as time went on, I decided to keep it in that period in part because that's when I was in college. Most of the characters in this novel are college students in their early twenties. And, you know, I truly have no idea what it's like to be in college now. Like everyone's on TikTok. They're all scarred from the pandemic. Like, I don't, I don't know any of the cultural signifiers or like, you know, the kind of like the, you know, the common touchstones. So, for you know for very real practical reasons i kept it in 2011 because that that's a time where i could realistically could you know depict what it's like to be a, an early 20 something um i and i'm i'm trying to think if it was harder for me to put myself back in that time period when i was you know in like 2018 2019 when i was just kind of finishing finishing up the the manuscript 
And I want to say it wasn't because a lot of what was happening in my brain then was, uh, there was a lot of nostalgia. If you'll remember, this was during Trump. Uh, the, you know, everything was kind of insane. And there was, there was almost this like, you know, nostalgia for what seemed to me like a more optimistic time. I remember having a lot of optimism when I was in my in my early 20s, you know, during the the second Obama administration, um, during Occupy, I remember feeling like very galvanized by that and feeling very optimistic, but also sort of feeling in the wake of the recession that um, the future had been kind of yanked out from under my feet. And so a, a lot of what I was doing was just kind of channeling that nostalgia for that, you know, the person that I was at that time and the things that I felt at that time. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Uh, we'll open it up to Q&A with everybody else. And Mark asks, how did you arrive at the ending of your book without disclosing how it ends? Oh, I, that's because I don't really even know how it ends. It was really, <laughs> it was really important to me that I, I don't like tidy endings. I never have. I, I really like kind of ambiguous endings. And it was important to me that to leave that open to the reader's imagination. So I, you know, I can't really tell you one way or another what, what happens. Um, I think it's kind of up to you to, um, to, to decide. Um, and like one of the things that I've that's been really wonderful about publishing this book has been hearing from readers and hearing what they think and what they hope for. I've had readers, you know, say, oh, I think this is what happened, but I hope that the opposite happened. Um, so it's 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 been kind of great to hear reader reactions. Um, but the in terms of craft, the craft of ending it, I found figuring out an ending probably the most difficult part of the book and I've I've heard from other writers that this is this is really common that it's that the that kind of sticking the landing is really the hardest part and I actually I was working on the ending up until after I'd sold it so after I sold the book I I did edit I did one round of edits with my editor and most of those edits were really focused on the ending because the pacing was you know was a little bit off and there was a, there was sort of a, like a lot of plot beats that we needed to figure out so the ending was probably the part of the book that I that I tinkered with the most. Anybody else, you are free to ask questions or to message me questions. I see Fred has his hand raised. Hey, Fred. Hey, thanks for the reading. You know, when I was listening to, to the chapter, it, it just felt very, um, it was, it kind of struck me like one long scene that just sort of flowed, but kind of like a, almost like the West Wing where you've got like this camera going down a hallway and then it opens out onto the lawn and then it's in the helicopter. It was just kind of like very seamless and, and very visual and very, I mean, it just felt so much like being in, you know, in like a, an art class in college and then like walking back with your roommate and then now you're in your dorm room and, um, I was just really wondering, you know, did you sort of see that whole day playing out that way and then write it? Or did you, did you start writing and see where the day wanted to go? And this is a very basic kind of craft question, but no, you know, it is it kind of like you had this sort of daydream first and then wrote it or? No, yeah, God, I work? wish, I wish that would be so much easier if I just daydreamed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would yeah. love that. No, the, the beginning, I reworked the beginning a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Beginnings are really hard because I think you have, you have a lot of balls that you're juggling. You have to sort of introduce the characters. You have to introduce like kind of tease at the main conflict uh, or at, at least one of the main conflicts um, in the novel. And you have to kind of introduce the setting and you have to do all of this without kind of info dumping, which is where you just kind of unload tons of information about everything that's going on and which is kind of clunky and not very effective um and that took a lot of drafts um i 
I, I mean, I guess the answer is I just wrote it. I rewrote it again and again and again and again and again. I think whenever something looks really seamless, and I think this goes for like any, any, you know, type of, of craft, like, and I include, I'm including like uh, sports in this too. Whenever something, you know, like something looks like a, a you know a gymnastics move or like a dancer makes it look really easy or like a horseback rider makes it look really really easy that to me is always a sign that there was a huge amount of time and effort um that went into um the prep you know the preparation for that and the execution of it uh and i think the same is true of writing anytime something is really really seamless and just kind of flows the way you're describing that probably means the writer did like 15 drafts and agonized and banged her head against the wall, which is which is what I did. Thank you. What other questions do you all have? I'm curious to know about like the the artwork. I mean, the book cover is gorgeous. Who? Thank you. Who designed it? Is it? Should I be recognizing this piece of art? Because I always no, <laughs> it's it's not famous. It's by a Ukrainian artist um, named um, Anastasia Balabina, um, and it was designed. The cover designer's name is Cassie Gonzalez. Um, and one little known fact about um, books is that the authors have very little say in the cover. Um, so I had, I can take, I love the cover. I agree. It's wonderful. Um, I can take no credit for it um, whatsoever. Uh, but no, I think, I think it's a, it's really fantastic. It really captures the, the novel. Uh, I think cover designers have such a hard job. They, they have so much they have to convey in one image, in an, you know, an image and a font, right? Um, that's all they have to go on. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's really fantastic. And, and the, um, the artist Anastasia Balabina is, uh, her work is really wonderful. Um, you can, you know, you can look her up on Instagram. Um, she's got, she's got it all up there. Resham asks, uh, well, she would love some words of advice to new writers slash debut novelists. What's something that you wish you could tell every budding writer? I so I guess my answer is going to be different if, if you mean people who are about just about to publish their first book or people who are just embarking um, on their writing journey. Well, what can you say to anybody who has their eye towards putting a novel out there someday? Um, I would say to take your time and don't rush and um, read a lot, read as much as you can, and especially read books that that you feel that your work is in conversation with. So authors who you feel your work is similar to or authors who you feel are, are tackling similar themes or who are doing things that you want your writing to be doing. Um, I would say, you know, reading really widely is probably just as important as writing a lot. Um, and, you know, other than that, I think everybody's different, but for me, it's, really helpful to have a writing routine. So I'm someone who writes every day. Um, I don't write a lot every day. I aim for like 500 words a day is my usually my goal and I don't always reach it. Um, but I think just kind of making it part of your of your daily routine um, and you know finding little ways to, to fit it in um, is is very useful. And you know I can't speak for everyone. I know writers, very successful writers who, binge write meaning they like sit down they write a whole long thing and then they don't write for five months and that really works for them too so I guess the the other piece of advice that I'll give is don't like don't take anyone's advice as gospel because everybody's different and every book is different and every book takes the time that it needs I know people who wrote their book in a year and while I am tremendously envious of them I don't you know I feel like my writing is is my writing takes the time that it needs um, so don't let anyone brush you, take your time and read a lot, I guess, is my advice. 
I think that's great advice. Your writing takes the time that it needs. Mm -hmm. um, who were some of the influences for this? You know, you said you read, read widely. Do you have any particular novels or authors that really informed the work as you were writing it? Yeah. Um, and these are writers who are, you know, are not necessarily writing kind of in the same vein as I am, but who, who, who do things in their work that I really aspire to do. So create sort of these really immersive stories and like really textured characters. So um, Chimamanda Adichie is a writer I really admire, um, Britt Bennett, Kristen Arnett, um, Sarah Waters, Susan Choi, uh, Jeffrey Eugenides, Donna Tartt. Um, it's so hard for me to like sum up these writers off the top of my head because I feel like they're just, every time I, I tell someone like who my influences are, then I, I always remember like, here's 10 more writers who I could have, um, who I could have mentioned. Um, who else? Um, Zadie Smith is another writer I really love um, and who, you know, who, who I really, you know, look to for, um, for craft um insights on craft um yeah I, I guess I I really gravitate towards um towards authors who uh create sort of these like really immersive worlds um even if not even if there's not a lot happening I'm not a super plotty reader I don't like I don't need like a really active plot but I really love these sort of immersive environments and really rich and complex and textured characters um, I see someone is asking, what am I working on now? Is there a follow-up novel? I've been asked if I'm writing a sequel and the answer is no. Um, <laughs> uh, once you spend seven years on a book, you don't really want to think about those characters or that story anymore. So I'm I'm leaving that behind. I'm leaving Sirens and Muses behind. Um, and I'm working on, um, I am working on another novel. Uh, it's still sort of in the early stages, um, but it's going to be quite different. It's um, the main character is a, an elementary school teacher, um, and it's a novel. It's a love story, and it's about um, language and religion and untranslatability and sort of like the untranslatability of love. Um, but it's still quite, you know, in early stages, so it might change a lot. I see Maria has a hand up. <clears throat> Yeah, hi. Thank you, first of all, for sharing with us um, your novel. My question is, is at what point did you realize that it was finished and out of your hands for the world? Oh, that's a really good question because I agonized over that a lot too. I, so I finished this book in, when, I, when I was in graduate school. So I did an MFA um, at the University of Minnesota and it was a three-year program and I worked on the novel throughout the program. And eventually um, I was in my last year and I gave the manuscript to my thesis advisor and she had me, she gave me some feedback. I did a round of edits. And then she said, you know, I think this is ready to send out. And I said, are you sure? <laughs> I, I, I feel like like it needs more. And she said, no, if you don't send it out, you're never going to do it. You can very easily sort of fall into a trap where you're just revising again and again and again and again. And you just never actually make kind of push it out of the nest. Um, so in my case, I really needed someone to tell me it's done. You, you can stop, send it out and see what happens. But I will say that sort of internally, what was going on with me at that point was I was really starting to churn against the book. And what I mean by that is that I'd spent so much time with it and I had been, you know, up inside this project for such a long time that I I'd, I'd gotten sick of it. I'd gotten sick of the characters. I'd gotten sick of my own writing. I, I really couldn't read the book without cringing. And that was a sign that I was turning on it and that it was, you know, I needed to stop. I needed to step away and let somebody else take over. Wow, thank you for that answer. Yeah, thank you for coming. We have a, an instructor named Sarah Aronson who says that when you start like just playing with the words, like should this be of or should it be about, that's when you're ready to like send it out. Mm -hmm. When like, you're moving commas around is another yeah. <laughs> another piece of advice that I've heard. If, yeah. you're just, if you're just changing the placement of commas, then it, you probably need to get it out of your computer and into somebody's 
onto somebody's desk. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we have nine minutes left. We do need to end this on the hour. Um, so while we're still here, whatever questions you have. Fred? Hello. Um, I'm curious how um, the year around, you know, having your debut novel launch with a big five publisher has been, you know, how's how have the contours of that been? And um, do you recommend it uh, as an experience? <laughs> you know, overall, how's it felt? How's it feeling? I feel really, I feel good about it now. Um, I, 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 you know, I don't have children, but I've heard, um, I've heard people compare the period after you put out a book or especially a first book as, as, you know, as I've heard people compare it to postpartum in the sense that your feelings can be really complicated. And in my case, my feelings were very complicated. I was obviously really happy and felt really grateful, but um, it's also a really vulnerable experience. And there's you know, a lot of fear and anxiety that comes with it and sort of a loss of control. I think that, that for me was kind of the hardest part that you know, for so long I had had you know, this, this this thing had existed as you know a word doc on my computer and not a lot of people had read it and I could keep changing it and it was kind of under my control and when you publish a book you know it's not yours anymore really it's like it doesn't belong to you people can read it and they might hate it or they might love it um or they might just feel totally indifferent to it and think eh meh and that's really scary um it's also you know things like sales and publicity are also not really in your control so for me, the, the most, the, really the most positive and moving part and the thing that makes me want to do this again, even though it was really hard and, and confusing in a lot of ways is hearing from readers. I, I've been just completely overwhelmed by, um, you know, pretty much every day since, since it published, I, I get at least one message from someone um, who really loved the book and that, like, I cannot describe what that feels like. It's incredible. Um, so worth it for that reason alone um that you know it's a really big privilege to be able to to share my work on this scale and i i definitely don't take it for granted um and yeah hopefully i get to do it again if i can write this next one uh any words of caution for debut novels novelists novelists in general um words of caution i for publishing your first book um, have a good support system. Uh, ideally, someone who's not a writer, people who aren't writers, friends who don't care about the publishing world. That's really nice because it kind of reminds you the world is bigger and life is more than this one book. Um, my partner is not a writer, which is great. Uh, highly recommend. Um, and I would say also just try and make friends with other writers. Um, community is really important. I've been really lucky to have to be in a support group for um, for debut writers um, and that has been really meaningful and a lifesaver uh, it's it's really you know it's nice to have people who are going through it too um, and who are sort of ha having all the feelings and having all the experiences as you're having them as well and to whom you can you know say hey this this happened and it, I felt really weird about it uh, you know let's let's talk about it um, but in terms of words of caution, um, I guess try not to get swept up in like kind of the hype machine and the way that some books just kind of seem to take off and others are kind of quieter because the fact is that your book is still reaching readers and it's still moving them, even if it's not, you know, getting reviewed everywhere or, you know, in Oprah's book club, it's still going to reach people and it's still going to touch their lives. And that's, that's kind of what it's all about. We've got just a couple more minutes. So are there any last minute questions anyone has? Well, Antonia, thank you very much for being here and for doing this. This was wonderful.
For everyone in the audience, you can buy Sirens and Muses at literally any bookstore because it was published through Penguin. Um, or, you know, buy online literally anywhere because it was published through Penguin. Um, and yeah, this was really a wonderful reading. Thank you very much for walking us through your process and for, for reading from this. And, and I hope everyone in the audience buys the book because it is incredible. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you everyone for coming. I'm always amazed when people show up to things. I'm like, nobody knows who I am. Um, <laughs> so thank you. It means a lot. Alrighty. Everyone in the audience, take care. Have a good night. And we'll be doing more of these soon. Bye, all. Bye.